Good morning and welcome to today's panel discussion, Navigating COBO 4.2 End of Support. I'm your host, Dan Sweeney, Chief Revenue Officer for CloudFrame, and thank you for joining us today. This event is being recorded and will be available uh, for a replay on our website, cloudframe.com. We have a full session today and uh, with lots of great content, and if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A chat box on the side panel. Our panelists will respond to them later in the session. Today's moderator is Greg Saxton, uh, CloudFrame's very own chief architect. Greg, can you introduce our esteemed panel, please? Absolutely, Dan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, appreciate everyone taking time on a busy day to join us. I'd like to uh, start out and uh, just ask our panelists to introduce themselves. And uh, Craig, how about we start with you? Sure. Hello, everybody. My name's Craig Mullins. I'm president and principal consultant of Mullins Consulting. And there I specialize in data management, database systems, and mainframe research and strategy. I have uh, over three decades of experience in IT systems development and administration. Uh, worked with mainframe DB2 since version one, and I'm a columnist for Database Trends and Applications magazine. Uh, I've also written several popular books on DB2 and database administration, and happy to be here to talk to you guys today. Thanks, Craig. Uh, Dale, over to you. My name is Dale Vecchio. I'm a uh, former Gartner analyst for 18 years. I covered the uh, IT modernization and probably took more mainframe in inquiries when I was there than just about uh, anybody. Uh, 18 years of software vendor, mainframe software vendor before that. I grew up on a mainframe probably 45 years ago. So I think we've established I'm the senior statesman on this call for sure. Senior statesman. Thank you, Dale. <laughs> Cat, could you uh, take a moment to introduce yourself and uh, maybe just give us a, a little bit of background on, on your, your inspiration for CloudFrame? Cat, you might be on mute, buddy. Okay, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. My name is Venkat. I grew up as mainframe application programmer. I was a systems programmer. I was a DBA. And um, I was also an enterprise architect at Bank of America. I created a strategy for them on emerging technology. I had background on mainframes. So they, I also did legacy modernization. That's pretty much two opposite end. You have an emerging technology and you have a legacy modernization. So through all these years of experience working on large enterprises, gave me an insight to create CloudFrame that helps transforming and modernizing legacy systems without taking undue risks. Thank you, Venka, appreciate that. So let's get into uh, today's panel discussion. I'd like to start with you, given uh, your background on this topic. So uh, let's talk about what's going on with Enterprise COBOL right now, IBM Enterprise COBOL. You know, what is the issue? Is it a problem? Is it just not a problem? What are your thoughts? Sure. Um, basically, uh, the issue is that support for IBM COBOL version 4.2, the compiler, uh, is, which has been available for over a decade now, is going to be discontinued by IBM soon. Uh, they've scheduled it to be withdrawn from service on uh, April of 2022, and that's less than two years from now. So you know, there's a short window for how people are gonna be able to respond to that. Now, uh, there are other versions of COBOL out there, version five, it's been discontinued, and version six, and there are several point releases as well. Uh, but that may cause you to say, you know, what the heck, why is version 4.2 still supported out there? And it's been supported so long because there are issues that cause migrating to a newer version, whether it was version 5 before it was discontinued or version 6 now. Uh, th those issues cause that migration to the new version to be time consuming and risky. Um, a lot of issues, but the biggest one is that if you compile your code, with that newer COBOL compiler than 4.2, it can cause incompatibilities and invalid data issues. And you know, there's a lot of nuts and bolts behind that that I'm not gonna go into, but 
you keep in mind, the data didn't change. Recompiling the program causes COBOL to work differently in how it accesses that data, which can create data failures. So you need to review what versions of COBOL you use and come up with a migration strategy and how you're going to do that with these potential data issues that you only find after you recompile. And this is significant because you know, a few facts about COBOL, it's still widely used by most of the Fortune 500 for their mainframe applications. There was a Reuters study a few years back that said there were over 220 billion, with a B, lines of COBOL code still in use. And those programs process over $3 trillion in commerce every day. So COBOL's in wide use, and there's an imminent decision you're going to need to make uh, on how you deal with those back-level versions of the COBOL compiler if you're still using uh, 4.2. Wow, uh, I did not realize $3 trillion worth of daily commerce. I, I did hear the statistic you know, previously about 220 billion lines of code. Um, so you recompile, something possibly breaks, even though the data didn't change. Craig, that sounds like a problem for pretty much any company with a large mainframe dependency, banks, insurance companies. Um, not surprising the same companies at risk of a, a fintech disruption by the digital natives that just don't have the barriers to entry now that you've got cloud technology so widely available and inexpensive to adopt at scale. So, you know, that brings me to a question for you, Dale. What are your thoughts? Are legacy technologies affecting options for organizations as they pursue cloud strategies and, and digital transformation initiatives? Well, I, I think without a doubt, the ability for any organization to innovate, to meet the business requirements of today's world. Uh, and you, this, this point about digital natives is an important one. When I was at uh, Gartner, and I spent a lot of time talking to financial services agencies and banks, and I asked them what concerned them the most. And the biggest concern was that the younger generations didn't like banks. They didn't see why they needed a bank. Well, so you can only live off of baby boomer money for so long. At some point, you need to be able to get to that, that part of the organization, that, that part of the uh, economy. Uh, and it's very difficult to innovate on top of these legacy technologies. I mean, most, most mainframers will tell you, oh, we can do all of that on COBOL and CICS and VSIM. Well, okay, you, you, yeah, you could have for the last 20 years, but you didn't. Uh, and trying to do that now in the face of a declining community of mainframe environments, I mean, IBM and a small handful of vendors are left, trying to do that in the face of a declining skill set, because COBOL is pretty much baby boomers. Uh, can you teach someone COBOL? Of course you can. Uh, has the world done it in sufficient volumes? Not so much. So if you're continued to be dependent on 3GL languages invented 50 or 60 years ago, pre-relational data stores, IDMS, Datacom, Adabase, vSAM, it's very difficult to have the kind of innovation you need to have mobile interactions, to get uh, into AI, to get real high quality business analytics. Most of the challenge now for organizations is they have to be able to respond to what's going on immediately. You can't wait for a batch job to run overnight. You need to be able to do that immediately. And a lot of that innovation is coming, you know, in an open source uh, Linux sort of Java cloud world. That's where the investment's going. That's where the innovation is going. So sure, these legacy technologies work. I mean, you know, there's as much COBOL as there is because of historical reasons more than, you know, desire. So the real challenge here is how are you able to innovate uh, in this environment that is changing as fast as it's ever been? And, and of course, you know, our current pandemic doesn't much help. Wow, that's, um, yeah, that, that, that's an interesting perspective. It, it, it sounds kind of grim. I just keep having that 220 billion lines of code in my mind while I was listening to you, to you reflect on your over 16 years as an analyst. Um, Craig, uh, you know, Dale mentioned something really interesting talking about not waiting for batch jobs, uh, about, uh, you know, information and analytics. You're, you're pretty much recognized as a data guy in the industry. You know, what are your thoughts about this business critical data tied up in legacy technologies? 
in the wake of companies trying to move faster, take advantage of, you know, availability of data, new technologies, cloud technologies. Yeah. Is this an issue? Sure. Um, you, you know, if you look at it from a data perspective, then yeah, there is a, a ton of data that's generated by your legacy mainframe applications. Um, and of course, businesses rely on that data. Um, and, and there's decades and decades of development on the mainframe platform that has led to all kinds of interrelated requirements and dependencies, you know, between the programs and interrelated dependencies between the data sets and database systems that are in use. And, and it's complex and you can't just pick up everything and move it to the cloud and be done tomorrow. And uh, as you know, Dale mentioned, that's especially true if you're using legacy and pre-relational database management systems like IMS and IDMS and database and so on. Um, so converting from that pre-relational into pre into relational is, you know, one of the first driving things you should have done probably decades ago, uh, but it's not simple. You can't just, you know, take IMS, convert it to DB2 and done. There are all kinds of intricacies behind how you do that. You know, and then you bring in the cloud and you know, talk about moving any type of data to the cloud is time consuming and, and difficult. Um, for example, uh, if you load data uh, for you know many cloud service providers, you know because of latency issues, it, it's not that you load it over the cloud. You know, what they do is they ship you a server and a disk array, and you load up the data, and then you ship it back. So you know I call this the rider truck access method. You know things aren't using any technology there. Um, so you, you need to be careful with your business critical data, and, and you know, that's you know, one of the reasons why uh, some of that pre-relational stuff is is very sticky. Interesting. I uh, just pausing here as I bring myself off mute. So uh, if I, I don't know if if you can see the the slide that Dan is sharing now. This is um, just a, a quick results from a survey we did uh, when folks registered to attend today. And what's really interesting is, you know, of the audience, we had about 55 people sign up. And, you know, overwhelmingly, people are interested in application modernization. So, you know, where do they start? You know, I know that's sort of a pie in the sky question, right? But do you modernize COBOL systems? Uh, like, how do you go forward from here? Because 220 billion lines of code is a big honking problem. Um, well, <laughs> there are trade-offs and risks and uh, you kind of have to understand them and, and be prepared for them. Uh, I always say COBOL is kind of like a cockroach. No, no matter how many times you think it's gonna die, uh, it's stuck around, you know, there was client server, oh, COBOL's gonna die, year 2000, COBOL's gonna die, now the cloud, COBOL's gonna die, and, you know, it, it's there, it's still there, and there are reasons for that. I mean, um, I think Dale alluded to the fact that COBOL works uh, for your business applications, and, and yeah, COBOL is a good language for the types of things we built in, in, in years past and that organizations still rely on, uh, and there's years and years of investment that have made those apps valuable, but but at the same time, uh, that you got to consider what the risks are of staying the course. You know, a lot of times the desire is just to leave things as they are, and that's a powerful force to overcome if you want to modernize. But you know, for example, uh, what are the risks of staying the course? It's difficult and costly to find skilled COBOL programmers. It's easy to find Java programmers, you just hire them young right out of college. And, and speaking of age, COBOL coders are getting older and older and are eventually gonna retire. And um, I say eventually, but you know, a lot of them already are retiring and it's difficult to replace them. Um, you know, your organizations are losing a lot of skilled mainframe professionals and many of those jobs are going unfilled because the skills are hard to find. Um, another risk factor for COBOL is that it's not as flexible as Java. So if you want to move things around, uh, you know, basically you're stuck with COBOL. With Java, it's, you know, you write once and deploy just about anywhere. 
and and then you know we can't forget the primary reason that we're uh, in this session today, and that's you know if you're using an older COBOL compiler, you soon won't be able to get support from IBM for it. So you need to undergo a risky migration to a new compiler version, even if you stay on COBOL. So yeah, it can make sense to modernize those legacy COBOL applications, especially when we're at this inflection point of COBOL 4.2 going out of service. Interesting. You bring up a really interesting point about you know the April 22 deadline with IBM withdrawing support for COBOL 4.2. It, you know, it, it sounds like no matter what happens, companies have to make an investment decision. They're going to spend money to go to COBOL 6, attract, retain, develop new skills to support those COBOL systems, or they're going to have to take those systems elsewhere, or they're going to have to manage the risk of running unsupported software. And I, I don't know. I know that's, that's really something you don't want to do in the distributed system. I don't know what the mood of companies is for doing that on the mainframe. Dale, you know, what are your thoughts on this? You know, do you modernize these systems? Do you leave them intact? Like, how do you deal with this problem? Well, this, this conversation often ends up uh, one of comparing extremes. You know, I need to keep everything on the mainframe. <clears throat> I need to move everything off the mainframe. I need to keep everything on COBOL. I need to move everything off of COBOL, you know, and it's, it's not that, I mean, you have to, you have to decide you're dealing with decades worth of investment here. You're not going to get off of it in a couple of months. So you have to decide, I mean, you've got almost one third of people say, suggesting that there's some cloud involvement in their modernization activities. I mean, that's a lot. So which applications are best suited for that environment and which ones can I leave alone? <clears throat> this is all, this is all about managing risk. I mean, change is happening, whether you like it or not. I mean, you know, cockroaches may be resilient, but not many people are all that happy having them around. So, you know, how is it that I can sort of move forward in a reasonable way here and try and reduce the risk? There are technical issues that drive a lot of this stuff, but most of this is where does my business need to compete? Where does innovation need to play a stronger role? And how can I evolve my application portfolio to take advantage of, you know, DevOps tool environments? You know, you have to be able to change and innovate much quicker. And that is much easier to do, you know, in a in a modern Linux, uh, Java world, or even a any cloud environment. For example, the, the amount of investment and innovation going there is pretty dramatic. So when we talk about modernizing COBOL systems, I really think <clears throat> we're talking about modernizing business function, business function that is instantiated in COBOL programs. And yes, they work, but will that business function as defined? for consumers 30 years ago, work for the kind of consumers you need to deal with over the next 20 or 30? And the answer to that is probably not. So I think you are driven to modernize these applications. We've come to a point <clears throat> where even preserving the existing portfolio has risk, as, as Craig outlined earlier. You know, this is a time where just staying in COBOL is not free. Yeah. Yeah, thank thank you. That's um, it's a perspective that's difficult to disagree with. Yeah, so Venkat, you know, we've uh, we've talked through some of the some of the challenges right now in in the world of enterprise COBOL. Um, you've talked about your vision, your motivation for starting CloudFrame. I, I think we'd all like to hear from you on you know what your thoughts are on how you go forward and, and how CloudFrame could help with this journey because you're clearly not going to, as, as Dale and Craig point out, just make this problem go away in a year or two years or three years. It's a journey and it can't all be done at once. Right, Greg. What we are finding is that most organizations they have a desire to modernize their applications. However, the challenge has always been balancing the cost and the risk versus the business benefit. Every company approaches the issue of COBOL modernization and what to do with it differently. It really comes down to how adaptable the application is to meet the emerging business needs. Now, most organizations only modernize when they're pushed by their business because they reached a business value inflection point for change. But the risk and the cost haven't changed. Only the business cost not to modernize is also change. 
At CloudFrame, our approach is to improve your business value of modernization by driving down the risk and effort required. Having worked in large organization, financial, fintechs, this is one of the most important thing. By removing the need to change the data, the program triggers like your schedulers, how they come into your CICS, ability to generate an aerated, refactored Java code, not just a Joe Ball kind of a code. CloudFrame can accelerate your transition to Java and significantly reduce the risk. That's really interesting. Let me just ask you a follow-up question, Ben. You talked about A-rated code. Whose opinion is that? So we use industry standards. Usually uh, there are tools available. Sonar Cube is one of them and most organization. We have seen many of the fin financial companies also use it for uh, checking the code quality, especially Java code quality. And that's part of their DevOps pipeline. Every time somebody pushes a code in, a Sonar Cube comes in and gives them a rating. And we get a Sonar Cube A rating out of our generated code. So when we convert a COBOL program, which has been maintained for you know, for maybe 15, 20 programmers over 30 years of uh, code, which is quite complicated. Once we refactor it and what comes out of CloudFrame is an aerated sonar cube code, rating given by default gate, uh, rating given by sonar cube. That's, that's pretty fascinating. I, um, yeah, I, I assume that there's probably a bit of vendor lock-in with this though. Is, uh, I mean, how is that packaged up? What does the code look like? And do, is there perpetual licensing involved? That is what we have seen all over the place. And that has always been a worry for every organization. Say, for example, you convert your COBOL to microfocus COBOL. You need microfocus runtime component licenses. You convert your COBOL from, you, if you write your Java on ZOS, for example, and use uh, JJOS packages provided by IBM, you're logged into the mainframe and you just cannot get out of the mainframe unless you remove all this underlying architecture that the JJOS provides you. What we do in the cloud frame, we provide you a Java code that can run on any platform without a lock-in. Now, you don't need a cloud frame dependency once it is in Java. Only time you need a cloud frame dependency is you want to run Java on Z, you want to have a backward compatibility with your existing COBOL load modules. You want to have a backward compatibility with your QSAM, VSAM, DB2 databases. Well, once you decide that you want to do a progressive modernization as part of your journey and you start moving your data sources, which is a hard thing to do. You don't have to do everything in one shot, but if you know, you, it's your code and you can completely get out of the vendor lock-in and get into the open source platform. That's pretty fascinating. So, you know, given that, Craig, what do you what do you think are some viable strategies for companies to to move forward with from a modernization perspective? Well, yeah, uh, legacy modernization is a kind of a it's a broad topic and it can involve a lot of different things. But I think probably the first thing you should uh, take a look at is a Gartner paper. Uh, and it outlines seven approaches you can take to modernize uh, legacy applications and legacy systems. I uh, put a link to that in the chat box for everybody. Uh, you don't go there now, but uh, take a look at it uh, after we're done with the, the, with the webinar here. Uh, and you know, this paper gives some good advice on the options and it ranges from encapsulating services to rehosting or rebuilding or, or even replacing. But, but even as you read through that, I think it's important that you keep in mind that a huge all or nothing modernization is generally gonna fail. And I, I think Dale you know, kind of hinted to that earlier, it's not all or nothing. So really to help you succeed, what you have to do is uh, kind of focus on uh, functionality and business requirements rather than something like the age of the applications. And, and I say that because a lot of times these modernization efforts are just if someone saying, hey, this is really old cold, let's replace it with something newer. And you know, that doesn't really reflect the business issues. So, so a best practice, is to focus on business decisions. Why are we wanting to modernize? Then you take a systematic approach to modernize the applications that fit best with those business requirements. All right, what I'm talking about. Well, uh, an example, let's say cost savings are the driving issue. Then you take a look at your ruling four hour average, find out what programs are running during your monthly peaks. That's what you're being charged on 
for the most part, unless you've gone to something like Taylor Fit Pricing, but most organizations are, are still using that rolling four hour average. Uh, then you modernize workloads that run during that peak. You might consider converting COBOL to Java because that moves the workload to zip processors. And when you run on zips, it doesn't run on the GP. And that means you're decreasing your monthly software uh, billing. Uh, or you know, an alternate approach, but you want to minimize risk. So you choose a lower profile application to start with there. And, and you know, no tool can make all these decisions for you. But if you need to modernize COBOL to Java with reduced risk, then something like CloudFrame can absolutely help you. Interesting. Dale, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, Craig, there, one of the challenges I think is there's no one option. Everybody's looking for one answer. What do I do to modernize my portfolio? And there isn't one. I mean, let's let's start with the fact that a lot of the easy stuff has already been modernized. Right. You know, what we're left with is the medium to hard stuff. Uh, if the business process that it supports is not really differentiating, a lot of people use the packaged approach. I'll just move this to package because I don't need the uniqueness, uh, you know, of my homegrown system anymore because it doesn't really matter. So I can move to a package environment. I mean, if it's particularly differentiating, you might invest in rewrite, but that's a long haul, you know, and it's not inexpensive. I mean, large scale service providers love it because it meters the meter starts running and you keep paying them, and that's great. Uh, you know, there's rehosting options. Uh, some require you to recompile the COBOL, one does not. Uh, and then you get into how can I really move to a modern environment? And in order to do that, while COBOL will run, you know, in a lot of places, uh, you know, it's 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 not really the environment you want to be in uh, to support uh, modernization. So if I want to get to where I can support, you know, real AI or business analytics or, or, or mobile activities or, or anything where you see the innovation coming, you know, you really need to start to get into that environment. COBOL applications are not just about COBOL, right? They're about the data stores that they use, pre-relational or not. You know, sure, there's a lot of DB2, but there's a lot of pre-relational still in the mainframe, for example. Uh, the entire mainframe operating environment, uh, which is a strong one, but is unique to that particular platform. All of these things have to change. So moving the code from COBOL to Java is one part of the conversation. And we talked earlier in this call really about the data issues associated with making this kind of a move uh, and then to be able to support you know the performance requirements that the mainframe is pretty good at and again this is it doesn't matter whether you move part of your workload off the mainframe you move part of your workload from the traditional zos environment to linux it doesn't really matter but what you can't do is nothing you can't just continue to count on cobalt because you're going to pay a price whether you like it or not going from COBOL 4 to the next version of COBOL, which happens to be 6. Yeah, now, you, you talked about performance there, Dale, and that you know, raises a question that I want to pose to Venkat. You know, a lot of mainframe people out there have this perception that Java doesn't perform as well as COBOL. You know, isn't there a performance penalty if you run Java, Java instead of COBOL on ZOS? Uh, yeah, you. Craig, most of that perception that the COBOL will always run faster than Java, it comes from the past. You know, earlier the Java used to be slower on ZOS. IBM had tried so many different things. They introduced high performance Java, and then they decided they're not going to go that route. But everything has changed since they introduced EC12 processor. And Toronto Lab, Toronto Lab has optimized the JIT compiler, and Java has something called a just in time compiler which has done a phenomenal job. The, the JVM on ZOS, the J, JVM J9 provided by IBM, has really done a fantastic job of getting the Java performance. And Java has come of age on ZOS. You know, and everything, every hardware upgrade there onwards had extra instruction for improving Java performance. There are improvement in the JVM itself. So now finally we are at a point where the actual performance between the Java and the COBOL, the difference is not a worry. And you remember, right, when you started with DB2, DB2 version one and two, everybody was saying, oh, DB2 is never gonna perform, so there is no reason for me to move out of IMS or uh, vSAM or whatever it is. And look what happened now, DB2 is performing well. DB2 has done a lot of work. And the same thing happened with Java over the period of time. So where you're gonna see really the performance characteristic differences is how you access the data. So you have your data on a vSAM, QSAM. 
files and you have a data on your databases like DB2. So when you access your data from a COBOL, you generally go through your regular attach facility like ESO attach or RRSAF attach or CAF attach. When you go from Java, you use JDBC. Now, the performance characteristic of JDBC is different, but JIT, JIT compiler does a lot of this job. There is a huge improvement on the JDBC performance itself, especially if you can run static SQL, which CloudFrame provides you an ability to run through. The static SQL is already bound. It already has the access part defined. Your DBS has analyzed it. And you're going to see a pretty good performance. So that is no longer a worry. There might be still things you can do on the Java. Java allows you to do parallel threadings. In COBOL world, what we used to do is we used to split a job multiple ways, run 10 job rather than one job. And then we partition our database tables of VSAM 10 ways. In Java, you can do that through the threading. Java 8 has introduced a lot of uh, Lambda function that can do parallel processing. So you have a pretty good significant performance improvement. So, Bedkat, let me ask you a question because we talked a little bit about the challenges related to data upgrading for COBOL. So, how does CloudFrame deal with that? If, if, you know, the, the, does the data have to all be converted to Unicode or ASCII? We, based on my experience, I've seen that is the biggest problem. Every modernization project and most of the projects fail because of uh, the data. Right? People think of a uh, move everything off mainframe, they go with this big ambition, they realize that your data is going to become a significant sticking point. The moment you change your format from AppCity to PAC decimal to Unicode or a different data format, you have to get your business involved. And you see what happens, just moving from COBOL 4.2 to COBOL 6, you have a data issues. You have a data, you call it an invalid data because COBOL 4.2 tolerated it. And I have seen many of the our, our customers have exploited that data. They have more uh, character values into display numeric fields, and they're trying to access a display numeric field, uh, assuming the data is going to be there in a numeric format. And it works in 4.2. It's not going to work in COBOL 6. So the data issues becomes a very significant issue. What CloudFrame does to mitigate this is we give you a progressive modernization option by not changing the data first. You keep your data exactly the same. Leave it the way it is on the mainframe. Start with that that reduces significantly reduces your risk and it's still going to work in java the way a java programmer would see it and good thing is your java programmer who's coming off a college or a new person has no mainframe knowledge never has to worry about whether it's a comp comp1 comp2 comp3 or peg decimal field to him it will look like a native java data type but under the cover cloudframe manages the data the way uh, backward compatibility so that is a that is significantly reduces the risk of your modernization. Well, you know, this is this is sort of one of the challenges on the mainframe is the, uh, you know, first off, some of the earlier versions of programs, you know, you could cheat and get away with it. Uh, you know, a lot of times what we're dealing with is, is things that people thought were a great idea at the time. Uh, you know, they seem to be a real clever option and now you're sort of stuck with it. The relationship between data and the way the program was written is one of the major challenges to any of these modernization activities. But at some point in anybody's modernization future, a data cleansing action is going to be required. I mean, you can't just continue to preserve this clunky data and hope for the best. At some point, this is, needs to be this needs to be cleaned up. So that sort of gets to the question, uh, Craig, you know, how much of this data is going to remain on the mainframe and how much is going to move off? Well, there's a loaded question. Um, I, I think the first thing I say is that the, the future of data is polyglot. Uh, you're talking about polyglot persistence, and that basically is that they you know, use the right data at the right time for the right project in the right place. Um, and there's no one place that all of your data is going to reside. It's going to live in many places, in many formats, and move all over the place. Um, but you asked about data on the mainframe, and, and yes, I believe a lot of the mainframe data is going to continue to reside on the mainframe. Uh, you know, one of the things I like to uh, talk about is this concept of data gravity. And it basically says that applications are attracted to the data, and as the amount of data increases, the gravitational pull of that data increases. So your software, your services, your business logic, uh, even other data assets get drawn to the data relative to its mass. And the greater the amount of data, the greater the draw. And you know, there's there's a lot of data on the mainframe. Uh, you 
hear IBM talk and they want to say, you know, almost, you know, the, the vast majority is on the mainframe. And, you know, whether it's the vast majority or it's a smaller amount, you know, likely there's a lot of data other places too. But, you know, there's a huge amount of data on the mainframe and, and moving data isn't easy. I mean, the larger the data set is, the more difficult it is to move. You know, data tends to stay where it is and you access it where it is. And the reason that is, is because it isn't simple to say, you know, in the 1970s, we built these IMS databases and even moving them to DB2 on the mainframe is a colossal project, you know, as opposed to, you know, moving them off platform to Cassandra or HBase or one of these NoSQL uh, DBMSs. So, so my best guess is that most mainframe data is going to remain on the mainframe well into the future. And you'll still see ETL moving things around both on the mainframe and off platform. I mean, you know, a lot of the processes that are out there um, are, are data movement processes. Uh, and I, I don't see that changing either because you know, everyone talks about data being the, the new oil which is a statement I don't, don't really uh, like, but you know, find it hard to disagree with. Well, um, well, look, look. I think you and I are going to have to agree to a good disagree on that point because I think an awful lot of data is going to move, but it doesn't matter what you and I think. Quen, Venkat, what you know? What do you see in your your customers? What what are they looking to do as it relates to these modernization activities? Yeah, the, what we have seen based on our customer, we have a Fortune 20 telecom company with over 100,000 MIPS capacity. And the management decided that they just want to exit the mainframe. There's a lot of ambition, there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm, but the reality when it comes down to start doing it, nitty gritty, when you double click on each one of the details, you find it's a lot harder. So they said, we're gonna uh, adopt two approach. We're gonna do a greenfield development. We're just gonna uh, start modernizing the whole thing. And then at the same time, let's see if we can somehow reduce the MIPS utilization on the mainframe. So they're using CloudFrame to use, reduce the MIPS utilization on the mainframe. And the way it happens is when you run things in Java, the Java is a zip, zip, zip eligible. And you know, zip is definitely a cheaper capacity that you can purchase from IBM. You may already have it. And then even the accesses to databases like DB2, uh, DB2 offloads a lot of workload coming from Java into zip engine. And that is a significant amount of savings. That's what they have seen a $4 million saving in their first 12 months of implementation. With similarly, we have a credit card processor that faced with a 20% year over year growth. And they want to avoid a future capacity upgrade. They want to make sure that the upgrade they are purchasing on the mainframe is a cheaper capacity upgrade, like zip capacity. So they want to purchase more zip engine rather than purchasing a general purpose processor, which is a lot more expensive. So they also want to have a support for their GDPR because they are in all over the country internationally and they cannot install mainframe in every other country. So they decided to use MicroFocus COBOL and they deployed the code in every other region. Now they're realizing that they really want to have a cloud-based offering and their goal is to transition to Java. One reason is, you know, you want to maintain Java code. It's a lot easier to find people who can maintain Java. Running on the cloud is a lot easier. Your DevOps pipeline, you can fit into your existing pipeline that is already being developed on your DevOps side. So that's their goal. We also have a US-based a global investment bank is planning to use CloudFrame to migrate their portfolio of performance monitoring application. It is one of the top 10 MIPS consumer and the application group is saying, I don't wanna be in the list, no, not me. And the business is demanding their processing volume is gonna go up double, possibly triple. They acquired this application through another acquisition many years ago and the people who originally coded it, it's not there. There is no in-house knowledge of this application. It's been maintained, it's been outsourced very difficult to make changes on it. So they says, this is a time, you know, it, it, everything is coming together. We want to modernize this to Java and uh, take it off, you know, either take it off of the mainframe, maybe stay on the mainframe. That is the decision they still have to make. And basically, once it becomes a Java, it's going to be a lot easier for someone to maintain it going forward, document the whole thing and reduce the cost, overall reduce the cost. They don't want to be one of the top 10 MIPS consumer. And then we also have a financial services software vendor. So right now, the software runs on the mainframe. They also run it on a cloud using HP COBOL. They want to transition to Java. They want to move to function as a service. You know, function as a service, serverless, serverless is a new concept. It gives them an enormous cost advantage and a scalability running on the cloud. So they, they are, they're going to save $2 million just by doing that, an annual platform cost save. 
That's that's really cool. I'm going to interrupt your, uh, your 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 sort of discussion here. Um, that was really helpful. I want to uh, just acknowledge Dan, who had just messaged me that we're getting a couple questions from participants. Um, Dan, do you want to speed off one of those questions, please? Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Greg. So the first question I have here is um, from a participant: is uh, I don't understand how you can say that migrating to a job is less risky than upgrading to COBOL 6. That, that sounds like a Venkat question. Just unmuted my microphone. Yeah, so I, you know, what happened is um, when you, when IBM upgraded from COBOL, you know, a long time ago, COBOL 3 to COBOL 4, the customer reported it was not that difficult, maybe perhaps a difficult level of three. When IBM moved to COBOL 5, there were a lot of reports, a lot of issues. People said the difficulty level is maybe six times or seven times higher than what we noticed with COBOL pre migration. And 25% of the customers who are upgrading to COBOL 6 are reporting invalid data issues. It requires to go back and figure out. You can only find out after you start running this. You have to change your compiler options. You, have, you might need a PTF, you might need an APR. There are complexity involved in there. So there is a risk associated, no matter which way you go. But this is a time if you decide there are certain applications that can take advantage of newer languages, open platforms, open systems. Java is definitely a way to go. And you're going to see the complexity of moving using CloudFrame from COBOL 4 to Java versus COBOL 4 to COBOL 6. It's going to be in a similar range or lesser. And the way the reason because when we generate the Java code, we provide you backward compatibility. It's not just that data migration issue. Remember, if you're going to stay in COBOL, you darn well better have a plan to grow and develop more COBOL developers because the world is not doing it for you. Forget the issue of my upgrading and the problem. If you're not actively building a COBOL workforce, you're in trouble. Right, and I think when you look at the question saying that migrating to Java is less risky than upgrading to COBOL, I, I wouldn't say that. I would say there are risks involved in both, and every organization has to analyze the risks based on their exposure uh, and their ability to support one versus the other. Um, so, you know, it, it, the way I'd phrase it is you can't say that staying with COBOL is without risk. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I, Dan, I think we're still okay on time. Did you have another question? Yeah, actually, um, it's, it's kind of similar, but um, it's related to data. So don't you still have the same data issues in Java as you do in COBOL 6? Um, yeah, if you, if, you use, if you manually convert to Java code, but if you use CloudFrame to convert your COBOL to Java, the, the converted code and the background layer the beans and everything's are backward compatible. They will, if it worked in 4.2, it's going to work in Java of the cloud frame. But you can't say the same thing in COBOL 6. You, you're you going to have a different issues. And IBM realized that people are misusing the whole data the way it was in 4.2. There was a lot of misuse. And uh, it's time to clean up the data. But what we say is it's a two separate issue. The first thing is you want to make sure you can modernize. And second is you can do the data cleanup as a separate effort. But if you convert your code from COBOL 4 to Java using CloudFrame, you're going to have a backward compatibility. Yeah, and I have uh, an, another question here. Um, my, my company is not ready to migrate to all our COBOL applications. How do I go about identifying the right applications to migrate? This is a good question, like Dale and Craig has mentioned that, you know, it's not like you just going to move everything off mainframe. If you, if you could, you could probably the companies have already done it. Those with the smaller mainframe capacities already moved out of mainframe, but large banks, insurance companies, they have too much of mainframe, too much of dependency. That's why progressive modernization is very important. You want to do it in a progressive manner. You, you have to start somewhere. And I think the easiest way to start with a cloud frame converting your COBOL to Java with a backward compatibility, it allows you to modernize in a granular and a step-by-step -step manner. Upgrading to COBOL 6 is still a modernization effort, right? You're still modernizing to a newer language. And it's the same language, but the newer syntax and the newer construct. 
this is an opportunity to embrace modernization, to get to Java and get the benefit of a modern language that brings to you. You can stay on the mainframe, take advantage of the platform. Uh, you can get off the mainframe. It's really the call, your management's call and your IT department's call. But the debate is not so much about the platform. Debate is about, I think it's time for you to modernize. So that's it for questions. I have no, no additional questions. No, no more in the chat box. I'm happy we got some questions. It's, uh, that was exciting. Well, um, thank you. So th thank you everyone for uh, participating today. Um, any follow up, um, my, my contact information is on the screen now. Um, and if you want additional information, you can go to our website, cloudframe.com. I'll be posting the, uh, a, a re uh, the, uh, the recording from today's session for um, further review uh, and replay if you wanna share with others as well. Um, and again, thanks for joining today. I want to thank uh, Greg for moderating, and I want to thank Dale, Greg, and Venkat for uh, a robust discussion today and uh, very informative. And thank you for sharing your expertise and insights. And I uh, hope everybody um, took something away from today's lesson. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone.